Good evening, everyone. I'm Meghna Chakrabarty, host of On Point from WBUR and American Public Media. And welcome tonight to a new series hosted by WBUR's City Space. It's called Remarkable Science, where we're going to take deep dives into all manner of scientific and medical and technological issues and stories with researchers and scientists and experts in their various fields, because uh, as we all know, with each passing microsecond, it seems the world of science, medicine, and technology become ever more present in our lives, ever more complex, and, and worlds that we urgently need to understand. So I'm very pleased that all of you have been willing to join us tonight for this inaugural conversation. And of course, we're going to start off with something that's touched all of our lives for most of human history, if not all of human history, but definitely over the past two and a half years, and that is infectious diseases, especially after as we move into the fall and the winter, a couple of new seasons here. And so join us to, joining us to talk about a whole manner of uh, infectious diseases and why they're in the news is Dr. Jennifer Nuzzo. She is the director of the Pandemic Center and professor of epidemiology at Brown University. Dr. Nuzzo, it's great to see you and thank you for joining us tonight. Thanks for having me. I've uh, begged Dr. Nuzzo to come on, on our show at On Point several times over the past two and a half years and every single time she's been a, a, a rock of facts and and solid information so it's really great to actually see you thank you uh, yeah in person, Jennifer. <laughs> and also with us for this conversation tonight is dr albert ko the raj and indra nui professor of public health at yale school of public health dr ko welcome to you as well thank you very much magna for the invitation and it's it's great to see you and, and to have you and i hope to have you on on point uh as time goes by now for everyone who's watching tonight, I definitely would like your participation in this discussion this evening. So uh, join us with your questions. There can't be two better people to answer them than Jennifer and Albert. So add your questions to the Slido box on the right of the video, and we will incorporate as many of them as we can throughout uh, this conversation. So uh, Jennifer and Albert, uh, and by the way, they both said it's okay for me to use their first names. <laughs> I don't want anyone to think I'm disrespecting um, our two guests tonight. But so we have, obviously, we're still in the COVID global pandemic. Uh, there's influenza season annually, kicks off around this time. There's monkeypox. And now in the past month, a disease that I never expected to pop back up into uh, the news and in our lives, polio. So that's actually the one I wanted to start with because I was just doing a quick search and it's only been a month between the first headlines I saw, you know, the first polio case detected in the United States in like dec a decade to more most recent headlines of polio is being detected in the water, uh, wastewater in New York and uh, Jerusalem and London and a couple of other places. So uh, Jennifer, if I could just start with you. Polio is a disease that there are people still alive who, who have had it, but yet it has, it's totally uncommon in highly vaccinated countries. So can you first just remind us a little bit about polio, the disease, what it is, um, and obviously how it got er mostly eradicated? Yeah, I mean, it's incredibly frustrating to me that we have to talk about um, polio outbreaks occurring. Frankly, in my backyard, I actually grew up um, near Rockland County and deeply disappointed to, to hear about cases there. Um, I knew about polio um, growing up because my mom was actually part of the clinical trials um, that resulted in the development of the vaccine. It was something she was always so incredibly proud of. And if she were alive today, I think she'd be really disappointed to hear that polio was once again circulating basically in, in our backyard. Yard. Um, polio is a, is a disease that um, has been, um, there's been a pro global program underway to try to eradicate it, basically to take it off the planet so that we don't have to uh, worry about it and worry about the, the, the severe disease that it can cause in a, in a fraction of cases. Um, thanks to vaccines, and there are two in use, we've made um, good progress in much of the world, but unfortunately, um, in recent years, due to um, slowing uptake of the vaccine or an increasing share of population not getting fully vaccinated, um, we are seeing uh, resurgence. We, what we've seen with these cases is it particularly um, related to one of the vaccines. So there are two vaccines in use. The one that's 
um, in use in the United States as an inactivated polio vaccine, but vaccines that are used in other settings, oral polio vaccine, not used here, used in other settings in very rare circumstances, the virus that's used in those vaccines can revert to a form that can cause disease. And so um, it is mostly a threat for people who have not been vaccinated uh, against polio in terms of being concerned about that um, severe disease. So unfortunately, what we saw in the United States was um, severe disease, actually paralysis in someone who had not been vaccinated uh, against polio. And it's really alarming because one of the features of um, polio is that the vast majority of the people who become infected um, may not have any symptoms or they may have symptoms that are not noticeable. Um, but in about one in 200 cases, um, paralysis can occur. And of course, this is the very serious form of the disease. So when you find a case of paralysis, you have to wonder how many infections are out there that you're not seeing. And certainly the discovery of this virus in wastewater kind of echoes those concerns. Yeah. So um, now I'm reaching back into my public health uh, hazy history here. So I, either of you, please correct me if I'm wrong. But so the reason why polio was and is so dangerous is because of you know the particular illness that it causes right the the paralysis it can cause uh, paralysis in the respiratory system right that's why those I remember those pictures of uh, children in iron lungs uh, and then a high percentage of the people who actually fall sick I think the fatality rate was like ten percent or something uh, perhaps even higher than that so it's a very very serious disease um, but when I uh, just today did a quick Google news search as anybody is wants to do. And Albert, I'm gonna turn this one to you. I just wanna tell you quickly what I found. Um, and uh, I think it's important because there seems to be, as we learned with COVID, there's a gap between like scientific, internal scientific communication and what's effective public health communication, right? Because Jennifer talked about the, the polio vaccine, Jonas Salk, right? Um, so I, a Reuters news article from just a couple of days ago is like seeking to explain how it is that we're seeing um, polio, uh, polio resurgence. And there was this paragraph, and it, again, this came after two clicks from me. It said, there are two main forms of polio virus alongside the wild type virus that they talked about above. There was also rare cases of what's known as vaccine derived virus, right? And that's what you were talking about, Jennifer. But um, Dr. Ko, you know, if I'm just a person quickly reading through some news articles and I see the phrase vaccine derived virus in a good de de percentage of the population, that's gonna set off some alarms. So can you explain a, a little bit more about, um, or pick up where Jennifer left off about why we're seeing this resurgence if it has to do with a vaccine de derived version of the virus? Yeah, let me let me first off and just reemphasize uh, what Jennifer said. I uh, think probably one of the greatest among several um, public health achievements has been really the elimination of polio in many parts of the world. Um, I'm, I'm of Korean descent. I remember going to Korea in 1969 and walking through as a little boy you know, through the streets of Seoul and seeing all the beggars lined up and all of the people, that's all the damage caused by, by polio at that time. And, and, and like what Jennifer said, I, I grew up right across the border from Rockland County in Bergen County, you know, probably about two or three miles from where the, the wastewater sample was sampled. And, uh, you know, to really have this all come back and happen after those kind of vivid images of my Boy Scout troop um, leader, you know, having polio, seeing uh, cases of polio in, in, um, in Korea, you know, it's really, it, it's a tragedy. It's a public health failure. So going back to what, you know, picking up on what Jennifer was saying, um, so let, let's go through the advances and the, and the good part of the story. So the, the two vaccines and particularly the oral polio vaccine, those, that was a huge triumph. Um, you know, we've saved lives around the world, saved kids from being paralyzed, the March of Dimes. Uh, and we got to the point by widespread use of that, of that oral polio virus that, uh, based vaccine, we got to the point where we, Pretty much eliminated, you know, cases mm -hmm. of three, one, two of the three types of polio. And what we call that's, and we'll call them wild types. These were the naturally occurring poliovirus, and that was poliovirus one and poliovirus virus three. Uh, you know, the as Jennifer said, you know, there is 
you know, a risk or there's a rate of these viruses because they're transmitted, they're alive and they're transmitted, they, they protect people, but they can go into the sanitation systems and into the water and people can get infected with these um, vaccine derived um, uh, uh, vac vaccine, the oral vac polio vaccine. However, you know, there is a frequency, a, a low rate of mutations that can cause them, as Jennifer said, to go back and they can re would revert to having, to causing disease. And that's what happened first with the, the polio virus, the second polio virus too. That virus reverted, you know, it was, came from the, the vaccine, reverted to cause polio, even though it was derived from, from the vaccine. You know, from the vaccine, we, we've actually eliminated or pretty much eradicated uh, the wild type virus. And now what's kind of worrisome what happened in the last, within this last year is that that's happening now with the third polio virus. So where we don't see wild type virus, we're seeing small little clusters. Now, obviously we need to put this all in perspective. The amount of lives saved by those oral, you know, polio virus vaccines or, um, was, was much greater than you know, what we're seeing in these clusters of cases. But if our end goal is to eradicate polio, these are worrisome, worrisome signals. Yeah. So if I understand correctly, you said there's a public health failure, but I'd like to really get a sense of what that failure is. Because it sounds like what you're describing is uh, a process of the, the oral vaccine is as the body is uh, you know, incorporating that, vac that vaccine into our um, immunological arsenal. Some of it does end up in you know, human waste and may go into the, in the wastewater. Then we have that reversion that, or that mutation that can, that can happen. But it seems to me that it wouldn't be a concern if you had a certain percentage of vaccinated people. That the only reason why it is the only reason why we're seeing now the in the number of cases from this vaccine derived polio because we've had vaccination levels for polio drop. Jennifer, is, is that is that exactly the public right. health failure? Yes, that's exactly right. And um, the, I mean, worldwide, this is a, an important trend where we're seeing an increasing, um, uh, um, increasing share of the population um, not availing themselves of the benefits of, of vaccines. And um, in this, uh, in, in the communities in Rockland County where this case was found and where some of the, the positives are, the overall vaccination coverage in those communities is actually quite low. So if you're someone who's not vaccinated and you go to a part of the world where this oral polio um, vaccine is being used and where there's the potential for the, the the vaccine strain to revert to this form that's capable of, of causing disease, you're not protected against that severe disease. And so there is the potential that you could experience severe disease. If you're someone who's fully up to date on your vaccines, then the likely then there's very low likelihood that you would experience severe disease. So really it's a failure um, to avail ourselves of the benefits of vaccination. And we will continue to see cases like this as long as these viruses are circulating in communities uh, where vaccine coverage is low. And that's why it's so important not just to make these decisions for yourself, but also for the sake of your communities. Right. So the, so the, just to be clear, the cases that we are seeing are for people who are unvaccinated Correct. for polio. Um, Albert, I would love you to pick up on that and, and add more. And um, as well, I mean, for, for people watching this who've received the polio vaccine as a child, because it's part of the the childhood vaccination schedule, should we be concerned as adults now, or are there polio boosters for adults? Okay, yeah. So, so just picking up from where Jennifer left off, yeah, I think you know we can think of this in, as a public health health failure in different ways, and, and surely I think the poignant um, you know example is what's happening in under vaccinated communities here in the United States. Um, uh, let me go back to another, which, uh, you know, I think this is, um, you know, there may be some sway of what people would use as a failure, but we had the opportunity mm -hmm. back in the 1990s and the 2000s to really, to really make the push and to eradicate uh, uh, polio. You know, large investments made by, you know, countries, donor countries throughout the world, including the United States, and, um, and, and really not seizing that opportunity that window of opportunity to get vaccination rates up all throughout the world. And, and mostly 
the most vulnerable populations in the world. Truly, really, I, I would consider, you know, the loss that loss of that opportunity. That's not to negate the hard work and really the committed people from WHO, CDC. You know, uh, many colleagues of mine were involved in that program. Really, the hard work they did. But, but I think our, the unfortunate story in this tale is is that we're going to have to do a reset uh, because of. Um, you know, because of being unable to take that opportunity that presented itself in the 1990s, 1990s and 2000s. Um, getting to your question about, um, yeah, how, how long is the duration of immunity? So many of us, like myself, I've had probably polio, oral polio vaccine as a child. Um, I think I, I, I looked at my immunization card recently. I, I got it four times and I got IPV twice. Um, you know, as part of the elimination program here in, in the United States. Um, the problem is, is that in, in, I, I think really to reemphasize what Jennifer is saying is that, you know, the problem is not necessarily the duration of the unit, it's really people not getting vaccinated in the first place. We have many, you know, children in the United States, but also in places where are at high risk for transmission, we've only gotten one or two doses, which is not enough. And what we've learned is, is that we, need to, to give the inactivated polio vaccine on top of those people who got the oral uh, polio vaccine in order to not only protect people from the disease, but to, to really get at the end game or the goal, which is to reduce, you know, to block transmission or eliminate and eradicate transmission. Okay. Uh, so Can I just add, Meg, just one please, point, um, please. in part because I'm not, I'm most worried about people who aren't vaccinated, um, and, but I've uh, been contacted by a lot of people um, recently trying to understand, well, I've been vaccinated, how worried do I have to be? Again, I'm worried about people who are not vaccinated. However, a number of people, because of these stories, are sort of going back and looking to see if they were vaccinated. And I've, I've heard from a fair number of people who discovered to their own horror that their parents actually never got them vaccinated. Oh, wow. So um, if you are able to access your vaccine records, that's a good place to start. But if not, it's probably worth talking to your um, healthcare provider to see, um, just to make sure that you um, are in fact um, of the vaccine coverage that you thought you were. Okay, so marching orders for people listening or watching right now are, if you can check your own records, do. Uh, and if not, at least definitely talk to your healthcare provider. And just to be clear, so if if children are receiving the normal doses, the normal schedule, the normal vaccine schedule for polio, they should be okay, right? We've not seen any reason to be worried about those okay. children. Good. Because I, I mean we want to put the we want to put the concern in perspective as well. And it sounds like the big takeaway here is A, we're seeing this alarming um an unfortunate resurgence because of the lower vaccination rate levels. And the solution to that is be sure you're vaccinated. And, and just to be clear, um, what these vaccines are doing is they're preventing advanced the severe form of polio. Um, and um, that is the thing that we care about. Like I said, the majority of the people who get infected with polio have no symptoms whatsoever, but in a fraction of them, they can have this very severe disease. And so the vaccines that we use and we give children here in the United States are remarkably excellent at preventing that severe disease, which is what we care about. Yeah, and again, I was just uh, again thinking back to all you have to like look. Let's let's use um, good information to our advantage. All you have to do is just Google <laughs> some pictures from what polio looks like and and uh, the kinds of uh, suffering that people used to go through. Um, and you take it very seriously. Again, people in my mother's generation that were just slightly older. I mean, we knew. A number of them that did suffer the effects of polio here in the United States. So I might be older than some, some of your viewers um, who may not have um, been able to see that to know that polio was something that that generation very much feared. And that was one of the reasons why my mom was so proud to be part of that vaccine trial, because it was a deep fear of her parents and people who grew up then, you know, the, the tales of parents not letting their children play or swim and in, in places right. because they were deeply worried that they were going to contract the disease and the, the vaccine really represented a triumph over that. Mm. Maybe, and, and Jennifer, maybe I can just add one other point and maybe, a, a, you know, the, the battleground for polio is still going to be in the poorest countries and most vulnerable countries of the world. And, you know, there are two countries that, you know, until recently, you know, were the only countries that had wild type polio, the first type polio virus one, and that was Afghanistan and, and Pakistan. And, you know, now we're seeing the vaccine derived polios, you know, uh, in, in different places. But, but 
you know, the, I think the bottom message is, is that, uh, as Jennifer said, you know, we're going to need to get the inactivated polio vaccine here in the United States in order to protect ourselves from getting those devastating effects of polio. But the, the, the work is to save lives also and to eradicate transmission, particularly in those hot spots in the lower middle income, income countries. We just can't take the foot off the gas on this, you know, you know make the same mistake uh, uh, twice, twice again. And, I, and there is a conundrum in, in this, in that sense that we, we haven't used oral polio vaccine here in the United States uh, until the 2000s. My children didn't get the oral uh, polio vaccine. That vaccine was good because it not only protected you from getting disease, but it also protected, it also blocked transmission. Mm. And, uh, and, and that blocked transmission because it, it, it would have induced immunity in the gut, you know, the side of action where the polio virus ha hangs out. We haven't given that vaccine since the 2000s. There, there are generations, there's at least you know, one generation of people who've never seen that oral polio, vac oral polio vaccine. And now that inactivated vaccine is, is, now, uh, is not gonna generate, doesn't generate that kind of blocking immunity, transmission blocking immunity that the oral polio vaccine had. So that is gonna be a conundrum for us here. You know, Again, but in putting the big picture of things, the, the battle is going to be in, in lower middle income countries where the risks, because the underlying social determinants of health are going to be greatest. Right, right. No, it's an, it's an important point. And it's also one of those ironies, because if I understand correctly, that um, the, the, the form of vaccine that can revert, as we've been talking about, has been used in many places because it's you can you can roll it out much faster in like rapid vaccination campaigns in areas of high need as well. Is that right? Absolutely right. Yeah. Okay. Right. Because okay. you can, it's the drop, right? It's the you know you can give. Oh, it, right. I it's see. Drop to the little baby with. A, okay. Okay. Um, so just one last question again regarding marching orders for all of us uh, who are the beneficiaries of your expertise. Um, should people, if they, if, you know, if they go to their, their physician and, um, and it's determined that they or their children should get an additional dose, should, should what should they be asking for? Should they be asking for oral vaccine? I mean, cause I think I'm getting a little confused by all the terminology. Right. So we don't use the oral vaccine in the United States at all. Right. And, and places that have made progress using the oral polio vaccine to diminish transmission have not needed the added benefits that the oral polio vaccine offers, and they've been able to switch to the inactivated polio vaccine, which doesn't carry the risk of, in very rare circumstances, reverting to the, the type that could, could cause disease. So there was a shift. And that's great as long as everybody gets it. Mm -hmm. um, but what we're seeing now is unfortunately um, people choosing not to avail themselves of it. And that's why we're, we're um, s seeing some of these cases that we haven't seen for decades. Okay. So we really, there's only really one thing we can ask for, the vaccine. But while you're talking to your healthcare provider about your vaccination status, I would add a few other diseases to the list because there's others in the news. Um, and I think looking at your um, coverage for uh, measles is important. Um, I know certainly um, if, you, if you've been pregnant or if you've had a baby lately, you've probably gotten another um, um, vaccine, vaccination for pertussis. Um, and so, um, and um, certainly people want to make sure you're up to date on your tetanus. So um, we don't often, I think enough, think of vaccines as adults because they're often things that we got as kids. But um, I think as we've learned for the past two and a half years that there are enormous benefits and it's it's probably worth something just making sure we're fully up to date on. Yeah, I actually think that's an excellent, That's a, so that's our excellent blanket <laughs> order, right? Just take a look at them all and consult with your doctor because actually you're, you're right about a, adult vaccination. The only ones I've thought of recently are of course COVID, flu and like, I'm a little ways away, but shingles vaccine sometime uh, pretty soon. That's kind of all I've thought about recently since I haven't done any uh, international travel <laughs> either. But look, we're getting some some questions here and then um, ab about polio. And then I wanna move on to talk about some successes <laughs> and other areas of concern as well. But someone wants to know, isn't polio vaccination required for public school enrollment? Uh, and if not, should it be? And Albert, do you wanna take that one? Uh, it, it is required for public school enrollment. And, and as Jennifer said, we haven't used the oral polio vaccine since 2000. And so it's the inactivated polio vaccine. It's just 
you know, it's, it's, it's quite simple, the, the message for, for polio and what needs to be done. Okay. And maybe just to add, yes, it is typically required, but what we are seeing as a result of the pandemic is actually a move to sort of loosen the school entrance vaccination requirements. Mm -hmm. Some of this is around the whole unfortunate politicization of the COVID-19 vaccines and whether or not districts are, you know, have or were thinking about requiring that. That I think has led to political movement in some areas to potentially revisit the whole um, schedule of vaccines that are required for entry in public schools. And in my view, this is perhaps one of the most damaging uh, consequences of the pandemic that uh, we could see far reaching um, impacts of is if we sort of roll back progress on all of these diseases that we have um, been able to make thanks to the benefits of vaccination simply because of political ideologies and false understandings about what these vaccines do. Um, so it's really important, I think, for us to, to guard against that and to, to continue to stress the importance of these vaccines and the benefits of of that requirement, because at the very, it, it, it offers an opportunity to make sure we're all where we need to be so that we can all protect each other. Dr. Ko, did you want to jump in there? Well, I, I think uh, Jennifer's spot on on that. Okay. Uh, and, and without getting into the discourse, so there are loopholes, there's exemptions, you know, religious and medical exemptions. And some states, you know, are, um, or you know the the rigidity of how they follow those you know differs. So I think our point's an excellent one. Yeah. What's interesting is before the pandemic, um, at least we had covered a couple of states that were actually trying to tighten their exemptions um, because of the dropping rate of vaccination among school children. Um, and as you said, Jennifer, it's a bit disheartening to see um, things potentially going the other way. But what I uh, want to do is take a step back here actually for a second and um <laughs> it just so it just seems to me that every conversation we have about public health recently has been about public health failures <laughs> but um it's not all uh, negative news all the time because when i if when i objectively look across all of the things that have happened uh since let's say march 11th 2020 when who declared covid-19 a, a global pandemic i actually, i actually also see a lot of successes. And I would love for you to highlight what either of you think are one or two successes, and particularly the ones that you, you think that we should you know, hold on to um, as part of our like permanent full-time public health and infectious disease um, arsenal, because we did learn a lot of lessons. And which ones should we, should we carry forward? Albert, you take that one first. Well, I'll, I'll take the obvious one. And, and that's, again, going back to you know, the meat and potatoes, which is vaccination. Uh, we've saved, you know, 500,000 or more lives, American lives uh, with vaccination. And uh, we're saving more every day because of vaccination. And, and, and I think that story has a lot of different rifts in that, you know, certainly one of them was, you know, which was enormous successes is how quickly, you know, from the sequencing of the first genome back in, you know, 2020, you know, how, how vaccines we had within you know, nine months, um, you know, licensed vaccines, you know, through the emergency use authorization. We're getting out to the most vulnerable populations, the elderly, you know, um, underrepresented minorities. People hit hard here in the United States. So, and, and that saved lives. Uh, we tend to see the glass half full and, you know, looking at the vaccine hesitancy, but we got a lot of Americans vaccinated very quickly mm -hmm. in a country which never had an apparatus for mass vaccinations. I worked 30 years in Brazil, lived there for 15 years. You know, Brazil on a turn of a dime can vaccinate 10 million, 20 million people in a weekend. Uh, we never had that here in the United States. So, so I think that's a big victory uh, you know, we had. Jennifer, go ahead. Um, of course, vaccines. I, I mean, I um, if you asked me the, in the beginning of the pandemic, would I think that we'd have had multiple safe and effective vaccines within a year? I, I mean, the answer would have been no, because that that's just um, truly extraordinary, though. It's really, a, I think, a testament to what that basically prior research and investment in research pays off. Um, but aside from that, because that's, I think, a pretty well publicized one, I think there have been a number of important advancements. Um, one is on testing. The fact that we can now test ourselves in our homes, um, I think that's an extraordinary breakthrough in medicine. Obviously, there are equity issues with their implementation issues, there's surveillance issues that stem from that. But the fact that we can test ourselves in our own home, not just for COVID, 
virus that causes COVID, but also flu and RSV. I mean, that's an extraordinary development. I know I had a baby that had RSV on Christmas day and was hospitalized um, to be able to have those tests at home, to know what my child had and to inform that care, that would have been um, really, really uh, extraordinary. Um, I also think we've made some important progress on um, telemedicine and being able mm -hmm. to deliver care. Now there's pros and cons and you know whether that's the same quality of care is different, but I do think it potentially expands access. And you know we obviously have to learn more about that, but I hope that that's something that we can um, continue to, to investigate and innovate on. Um, and then finally, uh, you know, when I got into this field and I told people that I was an epidemiologist, almost nobody knew what that meant if you, they weren't in the field. <laughs> um, now people know, um, which I think is extraordinary. And it's also extraordinary because it's translated to a real surge in enthusiasm for public health. Enrollments at all of our schools are um, off the charts, interest in, in uh, in public health as a field and, and applications um, to public health schools is off the charts. So I am buoyed by that surge in interest from the next generation who, you know, are going to be on the front lines of this, um, that they have kind of discovered a passion around these issues because they've seen it affect their lives and the lives of their loved one, and they want to make a difference. Yeah, absolutely. Megna, could I, could I just add one more to that list? Um, and, and people can take this both ways, but, uh, now, in states that had a commitment to health equity, they achieved health equity during uh, the COVID pandemic. I had the privilege of living in Connecticut and, and, and being part of the Connecticut response with Governor Lamont and the administration. In the first wave of COVID in 2000, March, March and April of 2020, it was a horrible pandemic, you know, horrible first wave, 11% of our nursing home residents died, but we had in our African-American population, the Latino population was dying five times more, five to six times higher than our white population. But with, with as Jennifer mentioned, with testing, with you know, ed, public health education, with rollouts of um, increased access to care, and then ultimately vaccination, that now that has dropped. And now mortality rates, for example, between African Americans and, and the non-white and the white population in Connecticut is 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 um, not significantly different. So there could be, I think, one lesson that we really learned here that we should take forward, and not just for COVID, not for influenza, but for all our non-communicable diseases. When we're thinking about mental health, violence, you know, cancer, hypertension, is that we can do, we can we can, you know, we could improve social justice, or we can. Mm -hmm can actually make a difference in those inequities that are inherent in our system. And, and I think, you know, several states in the United States, you know, Massachusetts included, where you're sitting, Megna, you know, put, put um, what it called, proof into the principle. Yeah. Well, and that's quite an accomplishment, uh, uh, Dr. Ko, about what Connecticut, Connecticut has achieved regarding um, equity between uh, groups of, of people in the state. So I didn't know that. Well done. <laughs> um, you know, the other thing I would add to the list of vaccination, commitment to, to health equity, testing, um, uh, increased awareness and interest in the importance of public health. Uh, I would also add that I think we as the public and and um, and and public health experts, have, it was a, a giant exercise in relearning the importance of effective communication. Um, and And I say that because we, of course, saw examples of extremely ineffective communication uh, and leadership and, and the devastating effects that can have. But then in other places, you know, in certain states, we had better communication. Other places around the world, we had leaders who were, who were, um, who were clear, not alarmist, forthright, factual, um, uh, and generated trust such that people made the made better decisions. So I think it was, that's a really important takeaway for, for all of us, both as people in the public health field. But in a sense, I, I suppose I'm, I'm self-reflecting here a little bit and thinking about um, in the modern age, not just media, but social media, any way in which information is spread and information is totally power in trying to um, better the public's health. But we need to really be thoughtful uh, about what we do, what we say, the stories that we, that we feature because um, people rely in a sense, even though it's public health, sorry, I'm rambling here, but even though it's public health, 
ultimately it's only as effective as the collective individual decisions that people make, right? I think. And so um, being able to give people the best information to make those decisions, I, I think I, I learned was like so, so vitally important to get the collective uh, as healthy as possible. Um, I should end that with a question mark somehow. <laughs> I mean, well, like, communication is one of our most important interventions. Um, and uh, if if there is a, um, it, it, I, I think that's an important recognition. I just hope it is followed with more investment in social science and behavioral science research to help us guide those communications. Right. Because I think throughout much of the pandemic, many folks, and I would probably include myself in this, we're sort of winging it, um, but we should have more evidence-based strategies for, for communicating to people and to know what resonates, what doesn't, um, how, how to um, uh, address people's concerns, how not to. And in an era where um, it's harder to get the message of truth out, uh, we need to make sure that when we get that message out, it is as pointed and as, as effective as, as it can be. Yeah, yeah maybe, maybe I'll just follow up on what Jennifer said. Um, you know, we had remarkable, you know, we had remarkable achievements, I think, in terms of science. Uh, certainly development of vaccines, the rollout of uh, tests, the development and evaluation of diagnostic tests, um, um, you know, therapeutics, um, you know, clinical trials that showed steroids saved lives uh, early on. I think if there's something that say, I'm gonna you know, turn it around and say, like, maybe the glass half full on this one is the communication. Um, we found ourselves many times, you know, and this is from experience with the state of Connecticut, where we had no evidence base. You know, mm. what's the best way to, to, to get the vaccines or, or to, um, to address vaccine hesitancy? Or how do we get people better access? You know, and what are the communication strategies for that? And so I think, you know, Jennifer, and, and this is a lot of her scholarship and her, her work, but, you know, I think we need more of that uh, next time around. Um, sure. Sure. Well, so we've mentioned uh, vaccines and the, and the COVID vaccine in particular a couple of times. We have this question from the audience. Has mRNA technology changed the outlook uh, uh, for infectious diseases? So okay. I... I remain optimistic, but maybe slight, my optimism is slightly tempered than it was maybe about a year ago. And I say that because um, mRNA um, technology, vaccine technology, I think hat is poised to potentially make a number of important contributions um, to um, prevent disease, but also to treat um, potentially other illnesses. So I think our use of the vaccine, you know, perhaps has broken the seal to more fully explore the benefits that mRNA um, technology can offer. So extraordinarily um, enthused by that medical breakthrough. Um, where my optimism is slightly tempered is that um, one of the benefits of mRNA technology for vaccines is the potential ability to rapidly update them. Um, but unfortunately, um, as we've seen play out throughout COVID, the, the kind of, I don't know, if it's, I'll just say the processes for actually updating vaccines and, and, and getting new vaccines that are probably be best matched to the viruses that are out there um, turn out to not be as um, fast to pivot as we would perhaps like. And so those are potentially tractable problems. Um, so, so um, and in my view, easier, much easier to solve than getting the next medical breakthrough. But I think many people, including myself, have been disappointed that we haven't um, sooner and more quickly availed ourselves of this benefit of mRNA um, technology, which is the ability to um, more rapidly update the vaccines as needed. Yeah, let, let me throw out one, I think, um, way that it may re potentially revolutionize how we deal with emerging infections or emerging infectious diseases. So if we go back you know, to pre-COVID, you know, this is after Zika, you know, we, there was a large emphasis or a large initiative, uh, international initiative. This was the WHO Research and Development Blueprint, as well as CEPI, the Commission for um, Epidemic Preparedness um, you know, Innovations. And, and these two, they were searching, and they had a list of priority diseases. Coronaviruses were on one of them, but literally it was a disease X. And, and the idea here in disease X and the searching before COVID was what was going to be the platform that was going to be plug and play. So if it is, if it's COVID one day or if it's a, 
you know, an influenza virus the other, how could you manufacture and get it approved and, you know, disseminated to everybody? And, and you know, the kind of, there were other, other platforms that were used, much more, you know, um, labor intensive, costly, and, and less, less efficient. And I think, you know, one of the advantages I think that we learned from the COVID is that this mRNA is a good platform or a potentially good platform as we encounter new emerging infections and the new disease X's in the future. Yeah, well, the, there are a lot of um, uh, both sort of scientific and political complexities to this and, and how frequently, um, you know, new formulations can be made because, I mean, for example, just right now, or recently the FDA approved the, um, the reformulated uh, Pfizer booster for uh, the BA5 subvariant, uh, COVID subvariant, I believe. And uh, again, if I'm, if I'm reading the reporting around it correctly, this particular reformulation has only been um, tested on mice. And so I think there are all, there's already evidence of concern out there amongst some people. I mean, if we're talking about vaccine hesitancy, uh, is that is that just a is that a misunderstanding about the effectiveness or safety of the booster? Or, I mean, should even uh, reformulations for updated variants still also go through all the stages of trial, including um, safety trials uh, in, for human clinical trials? Jennifer, I'll toss that one to you. Yeah, so it's true that the vac the data that were submitted to get the um, authorization of the, the reformulated boosters were um, not from hu human, they weren't human data. Um, those data are being collected and they will come, but they um, weren't used in the decision-making um, around the authorization of these boosters. Um, but uh, recognize that um, we now have extraordinarily um, rich amount of data regarding the safety and efficacy of boosters. And um, what you're just seeing here is a swap of, of um, the virus type, or, you know, the target used to create these new boosters, um, for which there's, um, you know, uh, precedent to think of of making swaps like that. And actually, it's one of the kind of visions for how we will get better at making vaccines in future public health emergencies, that perhaps we can do some of the preliminary research before on um, classes of viruses uh, that we might worry about. Coronaviruses were on our list of things we worried about before um, 2020. Um, but, uh, you know, could we have done the research in advance to, to evaluate certain um, vaccines based on the viruses that we knew and then if something emerged, uh, perhaps um, swap it out for uh, what the actual virus is and to try to, you know, expedite the, the um, authorization of that such that we don't unnecessarily risk losing lives um, when we have sound data um, su suggesting um, the, the safety and efficacy of those vaccines for, for near relatives. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's, um, uh, possibly, I, I think a concern that's um, you know understandable given the headlines, but it's um, not one that I particularly worry about, and um, I haven't yet gotten the new booster. Um, and maybe we can have a conversation about timing of when to get it, but um, it's not something that I'm worried about in terms of getting um, vaccinated. Well, so let me put a little refinement on here, right? Because um, I wish we could only talk. I wish that the uh, our area of focus could be exclusively this you know, science, but it's not, right? It's science, it's politics, it's implementation, um, it's public perception. I mean, that that is public health, right, writ large. And, you know, I, I do wonder um, if the human data is being collected now, I mean, should the FDA have, FDA have waited a little bit before authorizing this booster um, so that there's no room for misinterpretation um, of, its effectiveness or, or safety once people hear like, oh, it's thus far only been tested on mice. Uh, Albert, what do you think about that? Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm thinking along the ways exactly as Jennifer is. Um, so, you know, there are certain phrases that came out during the pandemic, uh, evidence-based, you know, we had evidence-based before that, but, you know, lead by the science, um, you know, the, but there, that doesn't necessarily mean that the risk, there's 100% benefits and 0% risk, okay? And, and we know that when we take any cardiac medication or when we go under a open bypass, you know, surgery, there, there are risks, you know, involved. 
but weighing this and to me and just to put what we have vaccines where we we don't test them in humans but we use them influenza vaccine is a good one you know that is a good example we have what we say call as correlates of protection uh, we know that this vaccine with all the experience we've had you know what makes a vaccine work by based on their the immune response that it generates um we are entering in that you know situation we, we have a lot of experience hundreds of millions of people were have been vaccinated with the mrna vaccines we know how they work you know um to some you know some degree we may not you know this is where the situation where perfection becomes the enemy of the good mm. and uh and and what we really are many of us are worried about is what's going to happen this winter you know we're relaxing uh social distancing uh face masking um our you know you know our barrier or our wall for against a large covid surge is going to be vaccination and increasing you know immunity around the population if we waited for perfect data we wouldn't have this vaccine probably for another 6 months hmm. you know um uh we you know from from now and we we'll lose that window of opportunity to protect our children to protect our you know, our communities um you know people living in multigenerational you know homes to protect you know uh protect everyone and and let me just go back to kind of a practical one as an infectious disease physician our hospitals before covid went into surge crisis every influenza season and i know i think uh magna you raised this and jennifer raised this so uh, we you know we we we've had crises before covid uh and if we have a large covid wave on top of a bad influenza wave you know that's we already have a weakened demoralized healthcare um uh healthcare workforce and uh we need to protect them and and so from a societal benefit this makes you know to me it, i'm just reiterating reemphasizing what jennifer says it makes perfect sense that we don't lose this window of opportunity to protect our, our communities and populations in our healthcare system mm. well if you don't mind i want to um shift gears slightly this is always one of the the uh, bittersweet aspects of these conversations like any one thing that either of you say i could think of like let's talk about for the whole hour about, about that one particular thing but alas we we can't um and i want to shift to something that sort of links what's happening in the present with then future preparedness um and it has to do with monkeypox and um a couple of weeks ago i spoke with dr ali khan who's dean of the college of uh, public health at the university of nebraska uh, medical center and he's all, he was also formerly at cdc as a director of the office of public health preparedness and response and you both know him well and and his career he's a globe trotting uh emerging infectious diseases specialist really remarkable person so um we talked about the uh, monkeypox monkeypox outbreak and um in the middle of the conversation he dropped something on me that literally has <laughs> been jaw dropping for me um he suggested and we're about to hear it he suggested that um our response on monkeypox should be actually serving as a warning this was a smallpox dress yeah. rehearsal wasn't it uh, in many ways so um no it's a, clearly we've defined it's inadequate i mean the good news is that we do have sufficient uh, vaccine for a smallpox uh, pandemic if it was truly smallpox but if this was a dress rehearsal uh it's not looking well and it shouldn't surprise us i mean given what we saw with covid given what we've just seen with monkeypox to do better we need to dramatically transform the public health system as it currently exists so that's dr ali khan and when he said um that a response currently to monkeypox was a smallpox dress rehearsal um i asked him what he meant by that and uh, you know he said in part it's like sort of the roll out and the availability of monkeypox vaccine because it's it's like right, the same right as uh, for a smallpox vaccine and um and that he was concerned that if for something that we already have a vaccine for there wasn't like a waiting period to create a new one for this that we weren't able to get it out into communities uh, as quickly as possible that it should raise alarm bells and and Jennifer I just wonder what you thought about that so he's absolutely right it should raise alarm bells um it's a dress rehearsal period, not just for smallpox. I have to stress for people who may not know, smallpox is the one human disease that has been eradicated. Um, I was 
very fortunate to work for 13 years with the man who led the global smallpox eradication program. And it is a remarkable achievement that we wiped it off the planet except for um, existence in, in uh, two known laboratories. Um, so when he's saying address reversal for smallpox, were smallpox cases to occur, it would be likely not under natural circumstances. It would yeah, so be yeah, just, can I just jump in there? So a deliberate outbreak. So I just have to clarify that so people aren't just adding smallpox to their 2022 bingo card of you know the next natural outbreak that they're going to yeah. have to talk about. Before you go on, um, I just I just wanted to add to that, just to underscore what you said, because um, what Dr. Khan followed up by is, is he's saying like it would only, we, could, we would right. only see smallpox again if it was like a bioterrorism attack or some kind of catastrophic lab failure because it only exists in very, 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 very controlled circumstances and in only a few places in the world. So I don't want people, like you're right, I don't want people to go out thinking, oh my God, we're on the tip of the iceberg for smallpox. That's not true. And because of that, there are different sets of plans um, because it would be a sec very much a security situation. Um, yeah. But that said, it doesn't matter. It doesn't take a, a you know, an attack um, to see how ill prepared we are. Monkeypox was addressed for rehearsal for, you know, many future and in emerging infectious disease threats. It was one that we should have um, gotten right because it was probably one of the easier scenarios. We had a diagnostic that was already deployed to um, laboratories that throughout the country. We had a vaccine. We had in development um, therapeutic candidates to use to help uh, treat people. So um, we had a number of tools from day one that should have um, allowed us to very swiftly um, contain this virus and put it back in the box. Um, unfortunately, there were several very, very, in my view, maddening missteps mm. along the way that make me deeply worried about our um, preparedness uh, as a country. And, um, you know, I think it points to many key lessons that we need to address urgently. And in the beginning of COVID, there were many missteps. Some of it you could sort of give up I won't say a pass to, but sort of understand because COVID was a new virus. We hadn't really experienced something in a long time, but monkeypox coming on the heels of COVID when the system's been activated, um, where we've been supposedly, you know, improving our preparedness all along the way to have this unfold in the way that it's been unfolding and um, possibly risk now seeing yet another virus um, uh, become a, 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 you know, a, something to contend with in this country um, for, you know, for the time being is is deeply on it's, yeah. it's, it's maddening. Albert, I'm going to come to you in just one second. But um, since Jennifer, since you were so emphatic about a, the number a number of maddening missteps, can you specify at least what one or two of those were? So again, we can learn and not sure. repeat those. Um, so for me, one of the first maddening missteps is that for um, uh, it became clear relatively early that the way that we were testing for the virus wasn't working. Um, I'm not a clinician, <laughs> Albert is, but when I heard from my clinician colleagues who were deeply motivated and deeply educated about this, that it was way too hard to get their patients tested, that should have sounded alarm bells that the way that we were going about trying to find cases wasn't working and that we needed to expand testing to include private laboratories. That took two months to make happen, and that shouldn't have been the case. Um, we should have also had a crash course on other diagnostic tools, potentially looking at other specimen types, um, like maybe saliva or other things, um, to see if we can uh, make it easier to diagnose patients, some research and development. Um, we didn't get the communication right, and we're still not getting the communication right. Um, there is, of course, worry about how to talk about the epidemiology of the monkeypox we're seeing in a way that's not stigmatizing to the affected communities. Um, it's, I'm not going to say that it is an easy thing to communicate, but this is a lesson that we should take forward every single time we have an outbreak of a new infectious diseases or an unusual infectious disease. Stigma will be something that we have to actively guard against. And the fact that we don't have ready, robust plans to combat stigma while also talk fairly to the data that we see is another preparedness um, misstep. Then of course we didn't have, um, enough vaccines and it took a while and there are a lot of government missteps about how long it takes took to get vaccines so a lot of things that i really hope we just open the books on and have a, an autopsy or a forensic dive into what went wrong so that we can finally fix these problems so we don't just keep seeing them repeating themselves over and over again albert go ahead okay so yeah no i i i, I think um jennifer really did a very good um 
semi-forensic dive into that. Uh, and, and just to reemphasize, we need that forensic dive. We, and we need to do it for COVID. We haven't really done it for COVID. And, uh, and, and I think the other thing she meant, you know, said was really kind of resonates, which is the stigma. Um, you know, we've, we've gone through the AIDS, uh, myself taking care of patients with AIDS, and we just haven't gotten right. And I would put the blame on ourselves and how, you know, the lack of scientific evidence, you know, and that we really, the social behavioral sciences and getting the communication right, and we shouldn't have been in this situation. Let, let me also take a different tact. Um, so monkeypox was probably circulating probably for several years in the poorest countries of the world. I, I kind of go back to this point, but it, you know, many of these diseases, there are diseases of vulnerable populations. Mm -hmm. And this was you know, um, circulating in countries which had maybe weakened uh, surveillance systems, certainly during the pandemic, um, you know, resource poor infrastructures. Uh, and, and I, you know, the one thing that's really frustrating for many of us who work in global health is that we're just, you know, making the same errors over and over. This is a structural problem. We saw this with COVID, we saw this with Zika, we saw this with Ebola. There are structural problems. We, we live in a highly globalized world where because of travel, because of urbanization and so forth, we're going to have drivers pushing, pushing the spread of these pandemics. And we just haven't gotten it right because we don't have the right structural the international structural bodies that are that are strengthened and appropriately strengthened and empowered to respond to this. So, you know, of course, there you know there are issues here in the United States. Those issues have been re replicated in many other countries, but we need to get it right at the international level. You know, until the U.S. and many other countries step up and do that, we're we're going to be in the same situation. We're going to be always the dog, you know, trying to bite its tail. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're sort of rounding to the last um, part of this conversation tonight. And over, over my many years of reporting and, and you know, being a member of <laughs> Homo sapien and watching how public health works, I always thought that one of the, the, um, the ironies of the work that you all do is that when public health is working really well, it's to most of us, it's, it's essentially invisible, right? Um, and that our attention is only focused on the need for good public health practice, good public health infrastructure, funding, all the things we've talked about today when there's an emergency. And so I, I call that an irony because we don't want to have those emergencies. <laughs> and I wonder if there's... Um, what do you think it would take to sort of permanently pull the importance of public health out of that sort of invisible shadow during the good times? Because those are also the times the funding goes down, right? Because people think, well, why do we have to fund it? Things are working, right? Um, such that it's more part of just what we as a society think is necessary for the overall well-being of our people, our nation, you know, you know, for for the planet, but out of, out of the, you know, out of just sheer self-interest, like, how do we make it part of how we conceive of as part as what is needed for the well-being of the United States as a country? Jennifer, you go ahead. So it's true. I mean, we kind of, I won't say joke, um, but you know, sort of lament that in public health, our our job is to make sure nothing happens, you know, to, to prevent the thing from happening. And it's hard to see what didn't happen. Um, and so I think that's that's a, a general sort of conundrum of the field. Um, but I also think we shouldn't limit ourselves with that view because I, I, I do think it's absolutely critical going forward that public health not be so invisible or um, be more visible, I will say, um, and to be in people's lives more and to show the work that we do. I think that's absolutely critical. And the the theme of this conversation was one new disease after another. This will keep happening. All of the data that we have suggests that the frequency of newly emerging disease outbreaks is increasing. They don't all become pandemics, but they could. And so we have to get better. At it. The system has to get better. And we as a society have to get better prepared. You know, we do a lot to prepare for other recurring hazards in our lives. We have fire drills, you know, we think about weather events, you know, tornado watches, all sorts of things. Um, and we need to build that culture of safety around infectious diseases that we have for other 
other hazards in our lives. Um, and, you know, I think some places in the world are, are better at doing this than others. Um, you know, one of the things I um, got the privilege of, of studying in my career was um, I, I got to go to Taiwan to observe that prior to um, uh, prior to COVID, um, after the first SARS, but prior to COVID, um, Taiwan would schedule every year an exercise um, to uh, administer flu vaccines and masks. And they did that in part because they wanted to make sure that people who were most susceptible to severe illness from flu got their flu vaccine and that they had a dedicated opportunity to do that. But they also did it to practice for the emergency, the pandemic that they thought could happen. So that when there was an emergency, people would know where to go and what to do and that they could test their systems regularly. And I think we have to do more exercises like that and to, to do that involving communities so that people feel part of the system so that the first time they see public health isn't in an emergency and that public health, this entity that they don't know what it is, just, just showing up in their lives sort of unannounced and asking them to do things that they're not quite sure they should do. Um, I think we have to engage with the community and have their values inform the plans that we develop. And that's, you know, I think a lot of the political tensions that we've seen over COVID was perhaps because we failed to be able to do that in advance. Going forward, we shouldn't. We should engage with communities and understand their values and have those values shape our response. Um, because they're, one of my favorite quotes um, is from a former Senator Sam Nunn, who in an exercise in which he played um, the President of the United States responding to infectious disease emergency remarked that like no force of the US government or no force of government, no matter how powerful, can compel 300 million Americans to do something that they don't see is in their best interest. Mm -hmm. So engaging with the public and having their partnership in the work that we do um, is absolutely critical for our preparedness. So I do hope that if we do more of that, that public health isn't something that people have never heard of, that one day they go back to forgetting existed. Mm -hmm. Albert, you're gonna get the last word tonight. Okay, well, let, let me just say, I think what you're describing, Megna, is that it's one of the several public health paradoxes. And there's a psychological, so, psychosocial you know, part in, you know, obviously when you're feeling well, you have less incentive to do prevention than if you're sick, you know, to then seeking tri um, treatment. And we see this in many senses, you know, not only in terms of adherence to care, you know, prevention versus treatment, but also in terms of reimbursement, economic reimbursement. And when you said invisible, what, you know, it's invisible and underfunded. Yeah. So these are structural issues. This, this problem that we've had in our public health system, you know, CDC, local public health, they've been caught. This is not something that happened overnight. It wasn't one administration. This is 20 or 30 years of underfunding uh, that happened. And that, I'm gonna go out on the limb for the last point. I think there's a second aspect to it. Those, if you look at those countries that did well, those are countries that invested in social rights, that invested in legal, had a legal infrastructure for social rights. And, uh, and many of those countries had universal health care. And we just, you know, as long as we're fighting that battle of not protecting our communities and populations and their social rights, we're always going to be behind the game. So I'm, I'm thinking of this as a structural issue, all solvable, but we require, you know, massive, um, you know, restructuring. Uh, this is Taiwan, Singapore, Hong Kong, Korea. They did this after the SARS. You know, they had probably one of the I wouldn't say the worst, but they didn't have really great public health systems before SARS and MERS, but they turned it around. And, uh, and we just haven't been able to get that right. And those are structural issues that I, I would highlight. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. And um, what's now needed is the political will to address those structural issues, because we can solve them. Um, it's not that we have to create brand new solutions out of whole cloth. We actually know what works as well. But this has been a truly tremendous conversation. Um, I could have listened to both of you for quite a while longer, but uh, Dr. Albert Koh, the Rajat Indra Nui, Professor of Public Health at the Yale School of Public Health, thank you so much for your time and your expertise tonight. And uh, Dr. Jennifer Nuzzo, Director of the Pandemic Center and Professor of Epidemiology at Brown University. Dr. Nuzzo, thank you so much too. It was just awesome to, to see you and to hear you once again. Thank you so much, what a pleasure. <laughs> And I want to say thank you to everyone um, who joined us tonight for uh, this uh, City Space event. Again, it's our inaugural series called uh, Remarkable Science, and I hope you join us for all our other Remarkable Science conversations. And uh, one more thing before we go, 
You can always get the latest on what is happening at WBUR City Space. We've got a monthly newsletter and you can sign up for that at wbur.org slash events slash newsletter. So one more time, wbur.org slash events slash newsletter. Uh, and by the way, subscribe to the On Point podcast if you haven't already. <laughs> Shameless plug for my show. But thank you all for joining us tonight and I hope you have a great rest of the evening.